Our next presentation is Putting the Shopper into Shopper Marketing via in-store behavior analytics. We have two presenters, Rajiv Sharma, founder and CEO of Video Mining, and Jeff Hershey, EVP of Strategy and Development at Video Mining. Gentlemen, the podium is yours. Great. Thank you, John. And thanks to everyone for joining us today uh, for our discussion, Putting the Shopper into Shopper Marketing. Uh, my name is Jeff Hershey, as John uh, mentioned, and I'll be uh, starting off uh, today's session. And in short, what we'll be doing is talking through the fundamental needs and why the shopper should be at the center of shopper marketing, and uh, then talking more about how new technology-powered solutions can actually enable uh, better decisions in shopper marketing. So let's take a quick look at the agenda just to give you some grounding uh, for the discussion. Um, I'll start off and, and just discuss a little bit about the state of shopper marketing and some of the um, fundamental challenges and, and drivers for putting the shopper in, into shopper marketing, and then talk through a few specific examples, real-world cases that uh, reinforce the importance of measurement. Then I'll be handing over to Rajiv, who will walk us through the in-store behavior analytics capabilities and how those advancements can help in bringing measurement to uh, some areas that were previously unmeasurable. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a discussion of particular metrics and how those can be used and applied uh, in a few real-world examples. So let's go ahead and get started. And basically, as I mentioned, we'll start off just by uh, sort of a state of the uh, shopper marketing space. And a quick review um, really indicates that there are two key trends that come to mind. And for me, those can be boiled down uh, specifically into two words. And the first of those is choices. The shopper marketing space has been uh, increasingly flooded and, and has an overwhelming number of new marketing vehicles uh, every day. And really, these, there are many things that are competing for your consideration in dollars. And these choices uh, range from traditional approaches to new innovations in mobile and digital marketing as well. And really, the result of this is that uh, the choice is there, but also a lot of noise. And really, choosing the right options and mapping them to the specific goals that you have is becoming uh, ever more difficult. Um, the second word that comes to mind is diversity. And uh, dem demographics are shifting. Uh, shopper segments are changing at a rapid pace. And really what this, uh, the result of this is that the shopper habits and uh, the complexity is changing as well. So when you take these two in combination, many, many choices in terms of where to spend your dollars, a really broad, diverse, and changing audience that you want to reach, it makes for a uh, sort of tough sledding in, uh, in a broad way, and there are some, some specific challenges then that we can look at as well. So we have really three main challenges um, in today's marketplace, and the first of them is, is pretty basic, and it's that this is still a, an evolving space. And uh, frankly, there's still debates as to what actually qualifies as shopper marketing, for example. Um, however, most people today agree that it's really confined to um, the specifics of what can be done to influence shoppers within the context of the store itself, and that is going to be our focus for today. But just the, the sheer fact that there is some evolution and there's still some discussion, um, and it, it means that shopper marketing is still really a moving target in some ways. And one specific way is that it's difficult sometimes to sync up the objectives of shopper marketing with other broader advertising and marketing efforts. And this results in a lack of cohesiveness and really uh, increasing challenging, uh, challenges in creating effective plans. So the second point there, in, and it's very well related in the focus uh, of our discussion today, is that measurement is, is a problem. And for a long time, there's been a difficulty to find consistent ways to measure the impact and the ROI of shopper marketing. And this makes it difficult to execute um, efficiently and also to repeat successes. So oftentimes people focus on diagnostics and understanding what maybe went wrong. But the reality is that oftentimes you're successful, but you're not sure how to repeat that success. So measurement's very important for that as well. And we talked a little bit about the second one, which is shifting demographics and the struggle to keep up with changing shoppers. But the final piece is navigating omnichannel pressures. And by this time, this should not be a new concept to anyone. Um, with regard to uh, the notion of omnichannel, it's everywhere these days. But I think that the important thing to note is that what we can as a, com a competitive situation between brick and mortar channels and then evolve to include uh, the blurring of offline and online channels, 
has now really shifted into a new space where we have a blend of all of these channels together. And the result is a very uh, complex uh, and difficult to navigate path to purchase, a single path to purchase. So faced with these challenges, what's, what's the first step that we need to take to, to address them? And uh, really we feel that identifying that missing piece starts with going back to basics. So if we think about, uh, you know, from a very fundamental standpoint, what is the, uh, the purpose of marketing in general? So regardless of which vehicle you choose, what segment you're trying to target, what your core purpose is, you know, the reality is that marketing is intended to change behavior. You're trying to alter the shopper's behavior, get them to do something different. You want them to engage with your product and ultimately buy. And obviously that is to drive sales. So this is a very simplistic way of, of thinking through, but it highlights a very key problem. And the problem is that all of the activity in marketing is happening here, but when we go to measure it and we try to understand the impact, we usually jump straight to sales. So what happens is we're uh, starkly highlighting this, this big gap in understanding the actual behavior that we're trying to change. So this leaves that middle step and that original goal of marketing, which is to alter behavior completely unmeasured in most cases. So one way to think of that is uh, the analogy of, uh, in a medical case, you're really treating the symptoms but not treating the cause. So you're, you understand the sales needle might have moved, but you're not exactly sure why and what are those uh, upstream uh, metrics that might be driving that sales change. So ultimately, um, clearly measurement is the key, and we want to focus on measuring uh, in the, the changes in behavior that are in that middle stage. So now we'll take a, a few seconds and look through a couple examples from different channels, um, specifically C-Store and Grocery and some work that we've done. And these really highlight and underline the need for measurement. And we won't dwell on them uh, individually too long, but uh, generally speaking, they reinforce that idea that you really need to be thinking about segments individually, you need to be targeting better, and you need to be uh, understanding which vehicles are best mapped to um, variables like trip types and, and where people are um, with regard to their particular shopping trip at that time. So our first example is uh, centered around the notion of occasions, and in, specifically in C-Store, uh, the growth of the snacking occasion. And this is something that we found in this case was especially prevalent in millennials uh, who were 40% more likely to make a seashore trip driven solely by snacking. So this is just, as I said, you know, a simple example, but it's one example of a particular segment that exhibits behavior that's uh, dramatically different from other segments. And it's compelling in that, um, you know, this diverse and changing environment for shoppers um, results in a need to basically understand them better and to better map and align strategies to reach out to them and uh, really target your budget, budgets better. So our next example comes from grocery. And basically what we see here is that 20% of shoppers are skipping the uh, center store entirely. And you know, this is something that is uh, aligned very well with the general trend towards uh, perimeter shopping and, and away from uh, center store. But really uh, what it means is that these folks aren't converting at all because they didn't even have a chance to convert. It drives home the point that you need to uh, reach them in terms of exposing them uh, to a particular category or particular product uh, to even have an opportunity to convert them to a buyer. So um, you know, specifically, if you think about where perimeter shoppers are, are trafficking in the store and where they're moving about, there's a, a huge opportunity in terms of displays and end caps and other elements of the store uh, to drive them to center store. So this speaks to the uh, notion of getting your messaging right, getting it at the right place, interrupting them at the right time in their trip to indeed then drive them to center store. And our last example also comes from grocery, and it's somewhat related because it is tied uh, in some ways to trips, but it's really to highlight the notion that the baskets um, are typically fairly small and that the window to get into that basket is pretty narrow. So uh, this uh, is really uh, representative of the competitive pressure, um, particularly in grocery, in that 70% of shoppers are buying 10 items or less. So they're mission driven, they've got a particular list, and you need to break that uh, pattern or that behavior. So it goes back to our initial discussion of why we're doing marketing at all. And really just another example to illustrate that doing uh, 
you know, making better decisions driven by the numbers and driven by data is important, and I think everyone would agree. But the key issue has been that this is the type of information that hasn't been measurable in the past. So how do we start to look at that? How do we start to break down the measurement and what's needed and, and what types of measures we should even be looking at? So the way that we like to think about it is in terms of filling a gap. And in this case, we call it the in-store information gap. And really the gap is created by, um, as you can see, sort of bounded by the consumer data and the sales data. Now there's lots of information available on both sides of this equation of the spectrum. On the consumer side, we have a good understanding of uh, shopper preferences, um, affinities for certain type of products, really all the drivers and uh, sort of propensity to buy and understanding of what they might do. And on the far right then, we have uh, certainly many, many resources for extracting and squeezing the most value as possible out of sales data. But what it does is it creates a gap. And really this is what you're missing. You're missing everything in between that happens physically in the store and all of those stages throughout the trip. Um, including and starting with who's shopping. And oftentimes I'll, I'll discuss this and people say, well, how is that different from the consumer and, and what I understand there? Well, there's a couple different ways. One is propensity to buy who might buy and, or who might shop and who actually shops. And often we see that that's very different. Uh, and it's also reflected in loyalty data where you might be getting a household uh, aggregate uh, understanding but not understanding the individuals in the household and how they shop. And then the next couple steps uh, are somewhat related to traditional media. So if you think about um, the store in general and where people go and their traffic patterns, there's a notion of exposure. Were they actually exposed? And, and we use the example of the, the center store. Um, you know, many of those people weren't even exposed to certain products because they didn't enter the center store. So this is a, another level uh, of measurement that sort of maps to the path to purchase funnel. And then the next logical step in understanding is did they engage? And this is uh, you know, synonymous with did they shop. So this is basically um, the transition from I'm, engage I'm walking through an aisle, for example. Do I actually stop? Do I engage with products? Do I view? Do I compare? All of those activities that uh, generally people would accept as shopping. And then of course in the final stage, um, understanding um, did they buy? Did they not buy? And trying to start to diagnose why. Um, not only why didn't they buy, but why did they buy? And this speaks to that notion of uh, being able to repeat success. So if you have um, a promotion or some marketing activation that, that works, but you're not sure uh, where it worked or how it worked in terms of the behavior in the store, it's difficult to repeat that or take that to a different channel and use it uh, to good effect. So essentially, uh, the reason that this is important and that we want to focus on this uh, in-store information gap and helping to fill out what you're missing is ideally we want to use this data to maximize the ROI from shopper marketing. We want to do better targeting. We want to make sure we're picking the right message, use the right vehicle, and all of those sort of fine-tuning or, or the levers that you can pull to better match uh, the goals that you have and targeting specific segments. So. I'm going to turn the uh, control over to Rajiv, and he's going to walk us through um, the how portion. And essentially, you know, now that we've looked at some of the, the uh, measures that we'd like to have, he's going to explain how new advances in in-store behavior analytics can help us actually achieve that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so by this time, you kind of have the motivation to see that they, there is an information gap in, in, in shopper marketing and why that's so critical in making shopper marketing successful. So what I'm going to do next is um, basically give you the good news that not, not, not only you have a way to fill the information gap, but it's actually very cost effective. In fact, VD mining has been at the forefront of developing technologies using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to address different aspects of shopper behavior, partnering with uh, some of the key uh, innovative retailers and CPGs over the last decade to make the solution, solution practical and accessible to everyone. Um, so what is shopper marketing? What, what is in-store behavior as, as it applies to shopper marketing? Basically, you can think of three different th components of in-store behavior analytics. One is simply sensing, the ability to sense 
the in-store behavior, and basically create big data on behavior. The second aspect, aspect is basically advanced analytics that is able to effectively process the data and convert that into something usable. The third component is really shopper science, which uh, basically brings the context, takes the data into context of in-store or CPG retail and tries to interpret and come up with the solutions that are relevant to shopper marketing. So using those three components, you can create a powerful solution to address and convert the data on in-store behavior into meaningful solutions for shopper marketing. But simply put, you can think of in-store behavior analytics as these three main components. The first component is, is, uh, is the, the store-wide tracking, where you're basically capturing the data on the path of the shopper as they move around throughout the store. You can do that through an array of video sensors, as well as Wi-Fi that captures the, the Wi-Fi signals from your smartphone. So, or you can fuse the two, combining video with Wi-Fi. So in a sense, you're able to get the visibility of the shopper path throughout the store in much the same way as you would get if anyone who visits your, your online or website. You can see how, how people are browsing and how people are moving around in the, in the store. The second big group is the detailed behavior of the shopper when they engage with a display or engage with a shelf. This is also very important for shopper oh. marketing because it actually tells how people are making decisions. And like Jeff mentioned, basically it's very important to understand the decision-making process in order to really effectively influence the decision. The third big group of in store behavior analytics is really about segmentation, being able to segment the shoppers using both video and Wi-Fi technologies so that you can actually address them or understand their behavior separately. This would consist of basically three basic segmentation techniques. One is based on demographics, for example, age range, looking at millenniums versus, uh, versus older um, folks, or gender or ethnicity. The second group is about loyalty. How loyal are they to the store or to the brand, which you can derive from how frequently they come to the store or how frequently they buy a particular product. The third is trip. So understanding the trip or mission for which they come to the store is critical for understanding you know, what you're trying to target. So basically when you take all the three components, store-wide tracking, detailed behavior at the shelf or at the display, and segmentation, you can begin to formulate a platform that, that you can apply to solve problems for shopper market, marketing as well as other aspects of retailing. So with this, let's, let's look a little closer at, at the shopping process. We all shop. Let me see if I can make up the video. So if you can see the video, you see, uh, you know, see a, a, a male, a, a young man, basically shopping a frozen aisle. You can see that he's looking around. He is, actually has a recipe book in his hand, and he's probably uh, referencing that in order to make his choices, look at the products, compare them, and then finally you know, put them in the basket. So you can see it's fairly complex, and it might actually change for, diff for the same person in a different trip or change from person to person. So clearly, capturing the data gives you uh, the beginning part of trying to understand what, what the process was. And if you, if you actually now look at real-world situations, that process is even more complex. Second video. Okay, so, so here you, you can see an even more complex situation where there are multiple people you know, shopping around you. That's the real-world situation. So if you really want to understand the shopping process, you have to actually see the shopping process in the way it actually happens inside the store, and it's fairly complex. So how do you even begin to sort of unravel that complexity? If we watch the video, certainly I will come up with some different conclusion Jeff will definitely come up with different conclusions. So how do you make this scientific? The only way it is possible is through automation. And the good news, again, is the, the squiggly lines and all the tracks that you see are the under the hood look at a technology that's constantly collecting data every fraction of a second about the shopping behavior 
as able to do at the scale so you make that process objective and i'll speak more about that process and you know the most most important thing is it's unobtrusive it's unbiased by you know the researcher bias and uh, you know it's anonymous so it's not just about the shopper behavior going to the the, the full store tracking that really is important as you can see in this particular case you can see the actual path of a shopper as they make their way around the store they engage with different parts of the store and then finally they check out the important of the full store tracking is that it gives you the context of the entire trip and by looking at the sequence they follow the places they engage the the kind of things that they do and the time they spent you can begin to frame together what what they are doing and how they are doing it and it's very important because to be effective in shopper marketing you want to communicate with the shopper at the right time and the right place for the right reason and understanding we say that a, a, a track basically to every path tells a story so you really want to understand the story of that that path or that trip in order to really effectively communicate with the shopper but obviously there is not just one shopper you have to deal with millions of shopper and uh, the shopper market marketing is not necessarily one to one so how do you begin to take, so what you see here is 7 hours of tracking in one store so you can see clearly that we are process, the the data that is generated for the path is enormous it's terabytes of data but it's also a treasure trove to really begin to unravel patterns about what's working what's not working and in like we have been saying measuring very specific impact of marketing vehicles shopper marketing vehicles so that that access to this big data on behavior is the key to really really coming up with a framework that that you can actually use to begin to move the dial in shopper marketing measurement and if if one trip tells a story suddenly when you have millions of trips you can write a book in fact you can write a book on shopper marketing that how to really it, you know understand the shopper and put them in the center of the shopper marketing which is the theme of this presentation so just to summarize the instro behavior analytics there's a lot to say but uh, basically you can transform the data for 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 creating solutions for at the macro level when you're total store level for example where to put the display and you know what part of the store you want to want to focus on marketing down to the aisle level or shelf level where you actually looking at very specific things within a category or within an aisle or right down to the shelf in terms of all the marketing vehicles right at the moment when they're making the decision so there's a whole range of levels of solutions that you can derive from the collection of instro behavior analytics but the key thing is how do you really make, begin to make sense out of this massive blobs of data and uh, develop a practical solution a key step in that direction is being able to standardize the metrics that you are after and 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 define what metrics are most relevant to shopper marketing so for that i will turn over to Je jeff to go over some of the key metrics that are critical for shopper marketing. Great, thanks Rajiv. And <clears throat> you're exactly right because the data is interesting and it's very novel and innovative, but to really get value uh from this new capability, we need to move beyond data and focus on the metrics themselves. Specifically those as you mentioned that we can standardize and use not only for diagnostics and testing, but also in uh in an ongoing way to do tracking and see how things are performing over time. So Um uh, so if we think back to that in-store information gap uh really the first and the broadest perspective um is that of the in-store path to purchase and I'd mentioned that the the steps that we talked about there really align with that path to purchase and this is uh, essentially just a nice visual representation of how the P2P can be split into uh five main buckets if you think of someone entering the store um and then traveling through the different logical groupings and spaces in the store so you have aisle traffic category traffic and then converging down to when someone's at the shelf and they're actually engaging and start to shop and then ultimately uh you know obviously convert to uh to buying so the next step then is to understand that in terms of the data so Rajiv mentioned that we collect and he showed a couple examples of how the data is uh measured at different levels so we have store wide measurement aisle level all the way down to the shelf and really those map uh really well to um different insights groups but to get there we need to use some advanced techniques so we're using machine learning some advanced ai to really take that data and translate it into something useful in terms of insights so if we look uh on the right side of our funnel there and and at those different insights groups 
Uh, you know, one way to think about these is basically they're all the things that you do uh, when you're in the store, and presumably you're doing them unconsciously. But as we walk through these next couple slides, I'd ask you to kind of think back to the last trip you made, and maybe you had a list or some other plan that was driving your trip. You probably shopped a display or interacted with an end cap, compared products, all of those sorts of little details that make up your shopping trip. And really what we've done is take that experience and, and map it to some standard insights groups. So starting with the first and the highest level, which would be navigation behavior. And this is really answers to the questions of where did you go, what was the sequence, um, what items or categories were you exposed to. And then naturally that flows to engagement and shopping that we've talked about a few times which is essentially where did you stop? How long did you stop? What was that engagement like? What were the characteristics of your shopping? And the next step in the light blue is our decision behavior. And this is really closely related to engagement and it's really a derivative of that that focuses on digging deeper to that moment of truth or that out shelf behavior to essentially understand where the decision was made. Was it pre-shelf or at shelf? And we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. And then finally, as I mentioned, there's a wealth of information from point of sale, and we use that to round out the funnel and in the form of purchase behavior, and this really gives us a really nice perspective, a holistic view of the entire shopping trip um, as it relates to the path to purchase. So one of the biggest benefits uh, of measuring in those particular groups is that it gives us some very actionable uh, metrics on the other end. And, and this is in the form of uh, multiple conversion rates, if you will. So um, those you see labeled here on the funnel. And basically it's that exposure rate, engagement rate, and closure rate. And these are metrics that allow you to uh, evaluate performance, diagnose issues, and ultimately identify opportunities to do better at different areas. And they map to shopper marketing in that you might have different vehicles or different messages that have different goals. You might be trying to drive exposure. You might be trying to drive engagement, for example. And those could be uh, you know, drastically different uh, approaches to shopper marketing. And then on the left side of our funnel, we have sort of the, uh, you know, the inverse of those rates, which is the leakage. And this is just essentially a, a way to quantify the lost opportunity and give another measure um, along the different stages of the funnel that's important to consider as well and, and, and it represents that opportunity that you're trying to recover at those different levels. So another key part, and we see over here on the right in, in, uh, in our uh, purple box, is the notion of segmentation. And, and what this does, it's a very powerful concept, um, and Rajiv spoke to the fact of uh, being able to understand shopper characteristics like demographics, um, understand what their trip drivers might be and the trip type that they're on. But there's other attributes and filters as well, such as store type, some more physical things like region or market. And when you take all of these and you apply them to those um, essential rates and the exposure, engagement, and closure rates, what it does is it really is a force multiplier and it gives us much more value out of those because you're then uh, enabled to get very specific feedback about how well you're doing with a particular segment. And this enables you to target better, refined messaging, and really uh, nuance uh, your marketing around those particular variables. So let's look a little bit deeper, and if we think about that next stage down being the aisle, uh, that brings us to aisle dynamics. And really the key with aisle dynamics is understanding um, the flow and the shopping, the traffic and shopping within the aisle itself. And we've got two visualizations here. The first is our uh, shopper heat map. And what this does is it essentially provides an at-a-glance perspective about uh, where shopping, and in this case traffic, is the highest, where the density is the highest. And it works well and dovetails with that direction of entry uh, map below, which uh, is a reflection of some of the measures that we collect uh, around traffic flow and traffic patterns within a particular aisle unit. And what that does is it allows you to uh, find the ideal placement for uh, displays and end caps, for example, and one of the uh, key components to that is understanding the relative position of those uh, you know, with respect to the primary stocking location. So oftentimes uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get an overall flow, uh, traffic flow understanding for the entire store and then pick out the optimal places to put an end cap relative to uh, when people will see that before or after um, the primary stocking location and those, those details matter. So the next concept is that of uh, shoppability. So if we 
think about the shelf level and all of the factors uh, and things that were changing. Um, this is really a measure of how those are impacting the experience. And what we've done is take a range of data points and uh, we analyze those and it allows us to arrive, arrive at a, a quantifiable measure of shoppability. And this is a really uh, important tool for understanding the true impact of marketing activations and other in-store changes. And really um, what it does is it helps us understand and answer the question, are the changes that I'm making or my activities impacting the shopper experience in a, in a positive way or for the better? And lastly, uh, I mentioned earlier this notion of decision uh, behavior. And we have a concept and an analysis called decision analytics. And this is a, um, an approach and an innovative uh, subset of our metrics that we use to identify the location of a decision, if you will. And in the simplest terms, this helps us to understand if the decision was made at the shelf or pre-shelf. So in, in concept, it's very simple, but it's a very powerful uh, tool in understanding how to direct your dollars and how to better map marketing efforts. Um, and the basic premise is that the at-shelf time is divided into three groups. You have navigating, deliberating, and selecting. Um, which are generally self-explanatory, but basically you're either finding what you want, seeking out a product, you're comparing brands, product types, pack sizes, other attributes, and then finally making a selection, making a choice to buy. And by measuring these three pieces, uh, we're able to arrive at what we call a decision mix. And this is essentially that ratio of pre-shelf to at-shelf decisions where the difference is uh, where did that deliberation step happen, essentially, as you see there. And the key here is that using the, this ratio or this decision mix uh, has major implications on uh, marketing vehicle selection, promotion choice, messaging, and, and, and other decisions that you might be making. Uh, for example, just a simple example is if the majority of your budget is targeting uh, in-aisle marketing and promotional activities, but a, a decision mix uh, analysis shows that you're skewing towards pre-shelf decisions, then that might be a, an indication that a lot of those dollars are mismatched and could be applied uh, to better effect uh, elsewhere in the store. So you might be using another display that intercepts someone earlier in their trip that helps to impact that decision by the time they get to the shelf. So these are all sort of interrelated concepts if you think about um, what we talked about earlier, the positioning of displays relative to primary stocking and understanding aisle flow and aisle dynamics, then the decision analytics is a nice complement to that in many cases. So this gives us a really uh, brief, but I think in, uh, an important understanding of some of the key metrics and analyses. And um, you know, the next step then obviously is how do I use this? How do I apply it? And in our final section, Rajiv's going to walk through uh, some of the core applications and discuss how these metrics can be transitioned into uh, impacting day-to-day -day processes. And then he's going to show a couple of real-world cases that help to reinforce uh, how folks have been using those. And um, I'll pass it over to Rajiv. Thanks, Jeff. So there's obviously a huge array of applications that can be enabled by the metrics that, uh, that Jeff mentioned and which are you know, derived from the in-store behavior. So what I'll do is just, uh, go through just a few of them, in, uh, as a matter of five of them, which we feel are the kind of lowest hanging fruit for shopper marketing. The first one is really simple, being able to track the effectiveness of a promotion in terms of what impact it had on the, on the behavior and funnel. So that is very important because it can actually pinpoint the ROI of a particular promotion and then finally help in finding out what particular promotion works or doesn't work so you can optimize it. This is particularly import, important in today's world when there's so much pressure on organizations to really prove the ROI of any kind of marketing spending. So this really helps in many, many different ways to go beyond sales and pinpoint how you can fine tune the promotions as well as get the most, you know, basically establish the value of it. The second group is, as we already mentioned, about display. And there's so many different aspects of display that you can optimize. The simplest one is being location. And what we found from doing hundreds of projects on display, that probably the simplest way in which manufacturers and retailers can collaborate today is to find the best location of displays, simply using data-driven driven approach to find the best, best mix of display locations that, that suited for the particular strategic goal for both the retailer and the manufacturer. And I'll give a couple of examples on both of them. The third one is kind of the obvious one that we talked about, being able to segment the shoppers by the different interesting attributes. 
so that you can fine tune your shopper marketing and being able to do that in a scalable way so that it's, it's practical and it's applied day to day in, in the retail, retail environment. The fourth application is very simple and obvious. Being the, the particular reason why it's important is uh, even though you can theoretically derive what's the best mix of shopper marketing for a given situation or a given target, the reality is that uh, many of the things are still an art. What message resonates best or what kind of innovation resonates best in a particular situation? So the ideal thing is actually being able to test that in real world situation. You cannot really recreate the environment of a retail in a virtual world. So you can re recreate the actual physical attributes, but it's impossible to re recreate the actual situation that motivates your behavior. So being able to test in the real world, particularly, for example, messaging, is, uh, is probably very critical before you invest in a long-term kind of in a more expensive campaign. The last is a little bit more of a new application that we, we, we formulated from last year, and it goes back to the concept of decision analytics, which uh, was the last metric that, that uh, Jeff mentioned. It's very important for, or meaningful for shopper marketing because it not only tells you where the decision was made very precisely for a particular category or even a brand, but it also tells you how shoppers are basically handling your brand with respect to competition. Uh, do they come in in the store with the brand so strong that they actually go in and, and just pick up your brand? Or they actually come to the shelf and deliberate and compare different brands? So there are specific metrics that can actually be attributed to the quote-unquote strength of the brand that you can track over time, and more importantly, see how you can influence that strength by different marketing tactics. So these are the kind of five sort of applications that 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 – that probably are the most immediate ones derived from the metrics and, and analytics that we have. Let me give you a couple of examples in the few minutes that I have. The first one relates to a, a, a big promotion that a, a, that a large supermarket chain did involving multiple categories and multiple media. So it was a big one involving radio, TV, social media. And it was fairly successful in terms of sales increase. What, what the client asked us to do was to really diagnose or understand this uh, whole promotion in terms of the impact it had on the behavior and to help it improve in a, in, in a find ways to improve the promotional impact. So we, we started the analysis in multiple levels. At the simplest level, we, we discovered that the entire promotion, even though it was a pretty hefty promotion, it failed to actually bring in any new customers to the, to the store. It was pretty, the traffic was pretty flat. What it did was, increase the level of engagement and traffic around the store. And obviously the interpretation is that it made the shoppers aware of the deals and they were moving around the store seeking deals. And that explained why the level of engagement and conversion was higher. So with that knowledge, you can actually help the, 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 the people involved, both the manufacturer and retailer, to direct the marketing dollars in the right way so that if they want to bring in new customers, they probably needed to do something different, not what they did. So it helps in actually making it more efficient for the next time. So beyond going beyond a particular marketing event, you can actually track these kind of promotions over time for a particular category, for a particular brand, because it is really different brand by category by brand. So what this example shows in a, in a few seconds is basically how the black the, the, the bar, bars are the sales week by week over time, and the three Curves are the really three parts of the funnel, with the green one representing the closure rate. And as you can quickly see, the traffic in this particular category was fairly flat over time, but the promotions really helped in changing the closure rates. And what we found out was that this particular category, the promotion was very ineffective during the holiday season in motivating the shoppers. So there was a big opportunity gap or mismatch between the promotional tactics used and what motivated the shoppers. So we were able to direct and inform how to change this promotion so they can be more effective during those very specific periods. Because from the sales data alone, they could not diagnose the, 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 look, the actual impact it had on the sales funnel. So that's an example of a very quick example of promotion tracking and evaluating the in detail promotion effectiveness. I'll just, we have time for one more example. Is uh, Again, we have done probably hundreds of projects involving uh, some aspect of display analysis or display testing 
One that jumps out at us as a very sort of low-hanging fruit was the very simple notion. What if you put, put a bread end cap and try to understand whether it leads to incremental sales? And if, it, if the end cap is next to complementary products like jelly and jam, does it actually impact the behavior and encourage people to, to actually buy those products? And we found out that we actually quantified very specifically what the incremental sale was from the bread, but also what the incremental sale was from complementary uh, strategies. So you can imagine these principles like that. There are hundreds of such small principles that, that, that are sitting inside the data. So what we have been doing is taking all of that and trying to evolve, evolve a decision, a data-based decision framework for optimizing both the location as well as other aspects of, of display. So that, you know, that's probably the lowest hanging fruit in terms of what's wasted week, by, week over week in terms of for putting displays without truly understanding what it actually does in, terms, in the behavior of the shoppers. So that is a very quick three examples. With that, uh, we basically come to the end of the, show, the presentation and open for the floor for questions. Sure, Rajiv. We have a few questions here that have come in. <clears throat> One, uh, I've been following video mining for some time. How has your technology evolved in recent years to better measure performance in shopper marketing? Very, very good question. Uh, yes, we have been evolving over time. Two or three key things. One is evolve from going from video only to Wi-Fi and having multiple sensing and data sources to make the data even more rich and accessible. Number two is actually the cost has dramatically come down as, the, as, as the, we progress on sensor technologies. And in fact, we are manufacturing our own sensors now. The cost is a fraction of what it used to be. And the third probably is simply with the large set of experiences we have evolved the science of how to apply the in-store marketing to practical solutions. So, so all, all of that has basically made the data richer and the analytics uh, more accessible to, to both retailers and CPGs. Okay. Another question. How does one access the data slash insights? Do you have existing retailer relationships? Yes. Yeah, so let me have Jeff answer that question. Sure. So uh, the access and essentially the three ways that we work are uh, through custom projects, and basically those span virtually any channel, any retail channel. Um, the second is a, a channel-based perspective where we use uh, a panel of stores to generate the data, and this uh, occurs in grocery and C-store um, specifically where we have um, established retailer relationships. We have a number of stores that are outfitted with our technology, our, our platform. And what does, uh, the output of that is a, a couple things. It's a range of um, fundamental reports and foundational reports that you can use to um, gain basic insights, but the ability to also go in and do some tests and, and uh, custom work as well. And then the last piece is for situations where, in particular, uh, particularly for category management and shopper marketing, where the application is much more um, account specific we have uh, started to evolve some retailer-specific programs. And, and essentially what those are are um, panels that are particular to a retailer where the data is much more uh, germane to interaction that you have there and collaboration that you're doing at a particular uh, organization. Okay, one more. Have you seen any shopper marketing successes that have included a charitable uh, competent with a CPG company allowing the consumer to give back and feel good about their purchase, probably component with sure. a CPG company. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a good question, and uh, you know, I, I'm looking to Rajiv. I don't know that we've been involved in any of those. I'm I'm uh, unsure if maybe some of the companies haven't done something like that, but we've not that I know of. Do you have any? We have had a couple of custom projects where we evaluated very specific uh, sort of giveaways that we did. So if that's one component, but certainly uh, we have the ability to do more of those kind of, uh, you know, specific campaigns involving you know, charitable contributions that, and see how that has impacted the interest and conversion or actual behavior of shoppers. But we have, I would say, a couple of sm small projects in, in that area, not big enough to kind of generalize to see how, they, how the whole charitable um, area works with respect to other, you know, forms of marketing. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Rajiv. We're going to close out the questions right now and moving on. Uh, if you need more information about this topic, you can reach out to Video Mining at videomining.com 
Also, the emails for Rajiv and Jeff are on the screen, and you can uh, reach out to them for additional information or some questions that uh, you may have after you reflect upon this presentation. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, everyone, for attending this seminar. Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you, Jeff.